Okay, so we have uh, the, the last session uh, in this first little set. Um, we have a, a, a brand new magazine. One of the most exciting things about independent magazines is there's just new stuff coming all the time. I ran an event in London in January, and one of the people who came thrust this magazine to my hand and said, my friend's making this, take a look. And it's this really, really interesting magazine um, which looks at the way that conflict is represented and the way that the images that we see define the way that we understand the world. I am not going to attempt to get any closer a definition than that because I'm going to get it wrong. So instead, I'd like to welcome George, Shivani and Ben to the stage uh, to tell us all about Contra. some water very quickly. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us, by the way. We really appreciate it. February 1968, photographer Don McCullen captures a shell-shocked US Marine during the battle for the city of Hue, Vietnam. The battle is remembered as one of the toughest of the Vietnam War. The Marine's expression, staring beyond the camera, shows the deep personal impact that the war had on many of those fighting in it. June the 8th, 1972. Nine-year-old Phan Thi Kim Phuc, naked and screaming, runs away from Trang Bang, Vietnam. The photograph cap captured by Associated Press photographer Nick Utt captures the aftermath of an accidental napalm strike on the village by the South Vietnamese Air Force. The photograph, I quote, underscored that the war was doing more harm than good. It quickly became a cultural shorthand for the atrocities of the Vietnam War. June the 5th, 1989, an unidentified man stands in front of a convoy of Chinese tanks, refusing to move. This symbolic act of defiance came one day after the Tiananmen Square massacre, during which Chinese troops attacked pro-democracy protesters demonstrating in the square. To this day, this man has never been identified, and the image has become a symbol of resistance against unjust and despotic regimes. April 2004. The CBS news agency published Im images of the human rights violations against the prisoners being held at Abu Ghraib prison in central Iraq. Several soldiers that were based at the prison committed and documented a multitude of abuses in the form of thousands of digital photographs. The most widely disseminated image was this image, which became known as the Hooded Man, partly because it was less explicit than many of the others and so could more easily appear in mainstream publications. The release and dissemination of these images prompted worldwide revulsion, a presidential apology, and newfound criticism and condemnation of America's operations and tactics in Iraq. June the 2nd, 2015. The body of three-year-old Alan Kurdi washes up on a beach near the coastal town of Bodrum in Turkey. Nilüfer Demir, who captured this image, remarked that this is the only way I can express the scream of his silent body. Major media sources from around the world chose to publish, publish this image, and as a result, Germany agreed to admit thousands of refugees who had been stranded in Hungary. The move encouraged the leaders of Central and Eastern Europe to create a humanitarian corridor from northern Greece to southern Bavaria, whilst Canada, Canada promised to resettle 25,000 Syrians. In the UK, former Prime Minister David Cameron agreed to accept 4,000 refugees a year until 2020. On top of this, it was the aftermath of Kurdi's death and the majority of European leaders finally promised to share the responsibility for at least some of the refugees landing on the Greek and Italian shores. In late September 2015, a system was created that would normally see 120,000 refugees relocated from Greece and Italy to other European countries. Although each of these capture a minor moment within a conflict, the effect that they've had is profound. 
They show how a single image can have the power to completely change public perception towards a war or those affected by it. The capacity for images to do this is no secret at all. Following the Vietnam War, the American government deprived global, um, global media journalistic access to the Gulf War in order to stem the potential flow of harmful images, eventually turning to the embedding system in 2003 following the occupation of Iraq. Through embedding journalists within their military, the government had found a form of tacit censorship by providing the media access to the war zone, but no freedom within it. The influence of the media on images such as this must not be underestimated. Their potential to sway public opinion um, only became possible due to the mainstream media's decision to publish them. The ability to influence or change minds lies with them. This is problematic when considering the agenda of many of these media sources, which only publish Im images to support whatever perspective they wish to project. So this monopoly that the media holds when it comes to this dissemination of images of conflict is a significant reason behind our decision to start Contra. A publication that aims to explore the relationship between visual culture and the situations which arise as a result of conflict. Having spent years studying the art and imagery of conflict zones, myself and Ben um, had become aware of how much there is and how little is seen. Through Contra, we hope to provide a platform to explore the visual culture surrounding conflict that newspapers weren't necessarily interested in. We wanted to create an accessible and non-academic journal that highlights some of the many voices who have something to say and something to show. Everyone has a voice when it comes to global conflict, and everyone has an opinion. Through Contra, we want to create a resource which has the potential to inform new opinions through shining a light on visual material that is not readily encountered. We think it's essential to be informed through a variety of sources <coughs> when trying to better understand what is really going on in the world, and whether through fine art, journalism, academic research, or simply documenting one's own personal experience, it's always possible to find new meanings and perspectives through exploring the visual imagery that surrounds a subject. So our aim has never been to force our agenda or point of view, but to attempt to represent many of those who've experienced conflict by providing a platform for their voice. Contra is about adding to the discussion, not trying to dominate or lead it. I'm now going to pass you over to Ben, who's going to talk us through a bit about the first issue, which was published in January. Of this Thank year. you, George. Hello, everyone. Um, so from the start, displacement seemed like the most appropriate theme uh, for issue one. Over the last few years, um, there has been a dramatic increase in images related to migration in the mainstream media as, as a result of what's commonly termed as the refugee crisis. Um, it is arguable that single images swayed policies and voters, and everyone has an opinion and everyone is engaged, as George mentioned. But outside of the mainstream media, um, but outside of the mainstream media, uh, there have not been many opportunities to consider the visual elements related to displacement. Uh, so while press move on to other headlines, the situation for many displaced, displaced people um, has not improved at all. Uh, so we want to support the effort to re-engage the public uh, whilst also widening the narrative. Um, and in an age where images are increasingly ubiquitous and form the prevalent means of interpreting global politics, it is vital that we critically analyze the manner in which we perceive conflict and displacement. Uh, so at Contra, we bring a variety of voices and viewpoints into the conversation. Uh, contributors to our first issue uh, include photographer Harley Weir, dancer Akram Khan, artist Oscar Murillo, and research agency Forensic Architecture. Uh, through a mixture of essays, interviews, photo essays, and original artwork, Contra aims to widen the discussion about imagery and its relationship to power, violence, and inequality. Uh, with this in mind, our target readership is not limited to those that work in arts and media. Uh, we want Contra to be open to everyone interested in the creation and consumption of visual ideas. Uh, so I'll now take you through a few examples of our content and tell you a little bit more about them. Um, so the first piece is by photographer Mikey Merkenschlager, um, who after numerous trips to the Greek island of Lesbos, has been working on a project delving into the complex and varied life 
that exist within its communities. Uh, Contraficus fo features a very focused element of his project, uh, which is a, a graveyard for refugees that was constructed by local residents within a field of olive groves. Uh, throughout his time on the island, My Mikey became incredibly familiar with many of its residents and conducted a large number of interviews uh, with a wide array of different characters from so local business owners, fishermen, olive harvesters, to police, NGO workers, and the refugees themselves. Uh, we often hear about the large numbers of refugees arriving on the shores of the Greek island, but Mikey's project goes far beyond more one-dimensional media analysis. Um, he goes into extraordinary depth exploring life on the island, weaving together many personal human stories that together create a wider, fuller picture. Uh, most strikingly, he explores the dramatic contrast between the sleepy traditional rural island life and the profoundly tragic events that surround it and resonate throughout global politics. Um, so secondly, there's a piece by a research, a research agency called Forensic Architecture, um, and it's written by two of their members, Charles Heller and Lorenzo Pezzani, who were the co-founders of something called the Watch the Med platform. Um, so the essay they wrote for Contra introduces a project that critically, investiga critically investigates the militarized border regime and the politics of migration in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so paraphrasing their own words, forensic architecture takes the forensic approach that seeks to find traces of events under investigation so as to reconstruct them and prove or disprove a crime. The traces we traditionally think of in forensic sciences are stains, fingerprints, gunpowder, etc. Today, events are potentially registered by an infinite amount of materials and media, from phone communication to payment data, from video shot on mobile phones to satellite images and vehicle tracking data, from sound recordings to rubble analysis. Uh, so forensic architecture seeks to bring these traces out into the light and working alongside human rights organizations and the UN, hold those responsible, often actors of the state, accountable for the crimes committed. So Charles and Lorenzo take this approach in this piece to the sea to document and demand accountability for the deaths of migrants. Um, they look at recurrent cases of non-assistance to refugee boats that were in desperate need of help. Uh, so one example they discuss in great detail is a boat that had been left adrift for 14 days despite repeated contact with state and non-state actors in an area closely monitored uh, by many, many military assets. Uh, so sadly, at that time, 63 people on this boat died. Um, so in this piece of research, they reappropriated some of the remote sensing tools uh, normally sort of associated and used for maritime surveillance, uh, such as satellite imagery and wind sea current data. Uh, they attempt to ascertain who is responsible for abandoning these people to die, despite full knowledge of their condition and location. Um, so the next piece is by an artist called Sabre Curtis. And in this piece, we featured images from various projects of his. Um, his images use a photographic language that perhaps is quite atypical of rep representations of migrants. The focus is never on suffering. Instead, what is not seen is much more important than what is. Uh, so Curtis's own story is one of migration. He was born in Argentina. He left the country in 2001 following a financial crisis that left the country in depression. This very deeply personal experience resonates throughout his work and the theme he chooses to explore. Um, so one of his projects that we feature is, is called 700 Miles, um, where he, he approaches the highly charged topic of the US-Mexican border, um, the photographs that make up the project universally avoid the key focus of the work, um, the border itself. And through this conscious decision, Curtis characterizes the whole project by what is absent rather than what is present. Uh, so another project that's included in this piece is A Few Days More, which explores the effects of a pact between Silvio Berlusconi's Italy and the Libyan government to secure both countries borders by counteracting illegal immigration from across the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so Curtis's project focuses on the effect that this had on those Egyptians trying to make the crossing to Italy, as journeys would now take several days longer as they were sort of uh, beginning from the port cities of Alexandria or Rashid. Um, so in this project, Curtis chooses not to show the boats or the people 
taking those treacherous voyages, um, which can be very problematic, but instead his images depict the last things that those att attempting the crossings see as they leave Rashid. Uh, for example, the ceiling of a gazebo as they wait for their boat, or the image of a loved one already fading. Uh, so I'm going to pass you over to Shivani, who will talk a little bit more about our thinking behind the design and Contra's other platforms beyond print. Thank you, Ben. Hi. So I'm going to talk about Contra on and off the page. Um, so our design is done in-house at a studio called Our Place, which is an independent design studio in London. It's, they work mainly in print and digital, so looking at branding, editorial, and typographic design. They took on, for Contra, they took on design direction, layouts, and our website, and they even created typeface specifically for the issue. So Contra Grotesque is a neo-grotesque typeface that exists in regular and mono, and they're going to be creating a wider family for issue two as well. Interestingly, due to the nature of the content, looking at a lot of European migration, um, a lot of the features contain names that actually are written in Greek, and so we have a full Greek character alphabet in our typeface, which is fantastic. Um, we're working with a range of different content styles, from sketches to photography and graphical plots. And so each feature is actually working within a kind of different layout series, and this varies quite a lot. So if you flick through, you'll see that from feature to feature, the design varies quite heavily, obviously while maintaining certain guides, for example, margins, sizes, hierarchies, and of course, the typeface. Um, Contra is you know, it's a very new project, and we're going to be much further along for issue two. And so the design will reflect this in a much more developed way, um, which we're really looking forward to expanding as well. Um, so as Contra deals with visual culture and representations around conflict, no doubt we're dealing with very sensitive material. I mean, the first images we showed here are all incredibly harsh images to have to deal with. Um, not all of the content in Contra, as Ben has shown us, is kind of within that remit. That being said, we are in a difficult situation where we want to balance kind of uh, accessibility and appealing to a wider audience whilst also not removing from people's voices through aestheticization of a crisis. Um, and this was a really interesting challenge design-wise, um, kind of understanding how to widen the net. Um, so when we say widening the net, thank you, uh, what do we mean? So Contra was born in 2016 during the US election in the hangover of Brexit, and this was a quite interesting time for us to think about the media bubble. We understood the kind of active complicity of every single internet user who was following links shared by their mates and thereby kind of funding fake news websites and actually funding extremist views. Um, however, this comes hand in hand with the highest prevalence of youth voters in the UK. So we saw this more as an opportunity to engage politically with people who are really excited about engaging with politics. Um, so to try and step outside of the media bubble within the remit of the fact that we're working within a relatively liberal artistic sphere, we try and keep our editorial voice very clear when it appears and realize we're not creating an objective account, of course, but to really let the work speak for itself. Um, and design-wise, that also is reflected. So a huge part of widening the net is being very active online. This is actually our home page, uh, which is interactive. Um, again, designed in-house at our Play Studio. And we've made sure that we're commissioning kind of fresh, exclusive content for our website. Um, we see online as an opportunity not only to engage with slightly more topical content, so whether that's monthly reviews of exhibitions or cultural events happening in London and abroad, because we have quite a wide readership, um, well, global, which is exciting. Um, we also are interested in kind of expanding to stories that wouldn't really work at an annual print magazine, so video content, interactive, graphical, journalistic stories. Um, so our homepage uh, has a sticky header and absolute positioning. And um, what's quite nice is as you scroll down, there's a kind of parallax effect that's created as you go down to the footer. Um, also, the articles on the home page are created using a kind of masonry layout uh, library. So 
when you click in, the images are quite sticky, and um, it kind of encourages you to keep on looking, which is nice. Um, we're also very active on Instagram. Um, we recognize that the way that people consume Instagram is that we're a tiny blip in an infinite scrolling that, you know, it's quite numbing, right? But we hope that because of the way in which we frame the work, uh, there's a second of slow journalism that happens, a slight, slight second of it. Um, and actually, we found that despite being quite a niche intersection, we found that we have a lot of engagement and, more importantly, a lot of engagement and feedback that translates into uh, you know, takeovers and actually, more importantly, submissions. So we've had people, I think two of our contributors or three of our contributors for our first issue came through engagement from our Instagram, which was really delightful because it shows that it's a conversation and um, was really important to us in figuring out how to make this a kind of community. Um, and we've also been commissioning kind of Instagram exclusive stories uh, which would work really well for that format. Um, so, we also run a series of sold out events in London, and this has been really fun for us because it's a really strong way of kind of getting new audience members in. Um, so these have included screenings, as you can see here, um, exhibitions, and also we've got some panel discussions planned where we'll have the opportunity to hone in on subjects in a bit more depth. So, at the screenings, Obviously, we want people to have a good time. But we also want them to engage critically um, on some level. So we've created these handouts that kind of double up as posters, fold-out posters. And on it, there's some discussion of the film and a little bit of information that you might want to think about kind of as you go home on your bus ride home from the screening. Um, OK, so finally, uh, what is our plan for the future? So at the moment, we've just launched with issue one, and uh, we're currently distributing this. So we have distribution in quite a few bookshops in London, which is great. We're now actually arriving in Germany in a few Berlin bookshops too, and in Paris, which is very exciting. Um, as I mentioned, we have had orders internationally, which is really delightful to see. Um, we're also now keeping the conversation alive through our online content. And so please do check online, and you'll see that. Oh, your mic's gone. <laughs> <laughs> hey, get off the stage. <laughs> Try to, does this one work? That one works if you want to. There you go. <laughs> I'll take it. Hello. OK, so finally, it's OK. We're almost there. So. <laughs> So as we're continuing this conversation online with more stories about displacement, we're also widening that a little bit to other issues around conflict and visual culture. And that kind of transitions us into our research for issue two, which will be a new topic related to conflict and visual culture and not displacement. We'll be looking at other themes related to it. Um, and so meanwhile, yes, please do stay involved. Check out our socials. Everything is under Contra Journal. And our website is contradanel.com. We're actually in the bookshop soda, soda books. So please do have a look through. And we'll be around. We'd love to hear your thoughts on it. As we mentioned, we're a very new publication. We're really, really receptive to any kind of feedback you do give. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to EDCH for having us and to Stephen for the opportunity. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So it's good. Come, come this side. <laughs> from this side. Um, so everyone should go and check out the website because you sort of alluded to it, but they've done this really clever thing where as your cursor moves over the text, it displaces the letters and they kind of like run away and then come back again. So what, what's, the, what's the website? <laughs> Contrajournal.com. And so you've got copies out in the foyer. Yeah. There's about, about 20 copies in the bookshop if, you, if you're interested to have a leaf through. The, like that talk, um, I hope has like kind of caught your interest. But you really need to sit down with this one and actually like engage with it. The, that story of the, the f is it called forensic architecture? Forensic yeah. architecture. The, the 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 complexity of that story. It's not a light read. Yeah, you have to. It's quite long, and you need to get into it because it's it's fascinating. But you need to sort of get but into the depth of the story. Really compelling. Um, I mean, oh yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Just just bringing you face to face with the stuff that is happening and it's unseen. Yeah.
Absolutely. Certainly. Um, look, we're, I, we're, we're up against yeah. time, so <laughs> thank you all very much for coming. And thank um, you. cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Okay. That's the end of our independent magazine section. Thank you for listening. We're going to have a break now until 4.45. Uh, fear, fun fun fear sig, maybe? <laughs> yeah, see, I said no more German. That was a lie. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you back after the break. Cheers.